Hey class, welcome back to Electromagnetics. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, interconnections between logic gates. And we're doing this specifically in terms of transmission lines, so this would be uh, something you'd encounter only when you're doing like some really high-speed switching and, and things of that nature. Uh, first, I'm going to do a quick historical background. Uh, so this individual was educated uh, and trained as a chemist and physicist in Italy. Uh, he worked for the Royal School in Como. <clears throat> this is a uh, portrait of this individual. And his name is Alessandro Volta. He lived from 1745 to 1827. Notable, notable things, uh, he discovered methane uh, around the same time or after, well, after Ben Franklin in a different location. Uh, he was the inventor of the first electric battery known as a voltaic pile. Uh, he was highly admired by Napoleon Bonaparte, so he was a contemporary of Napoleon, of course. Uh, the SI unit for electrical potential is named in his honor, so what should be all familiar now is volts or voltage. And uh, he said settled uh, debunked the prevalent theory of animal electricity. So, uh, you might be wondering what that's all about, uh, animal electricity. An Italian physicist named Luigi Galvani discovered something he named animal electricity, which led him to believe that electricity was generated solely by living things. Volta debunked this theory with his uh, invention of the electric battery, which of course produced electricity outside of a human being, utilizing galvan uh, galvanic cells to chemically produce electric potential, which of course this is the predecessor to our modern day battery. Don't feel too bad though for Luigi, uh, his work was the beginning of bioelectricity as he noted that the frog's leg muscles twitched when exposed to an electric potential. Of course, uh, human bodies do transmit electric signals. That's the way our nervous system works and our brain acts. There's a portrait of Mr. Galvani, um, and this is a depiction of his laboratory where you can see the frog legs there, and he was uh, able to make the legs twitch by inducing uh, the electric potential on the nerve endings. So this lecture will wrap up part seven. Again, we're going to be looking at interconnections between logic gates. So, so far, we've uh, been concerned with time domain analysis for lines with linear terminations and discontinuities. Now we want to extend this analysis to logic gates. Now logic gates are different in that they have nonlinear terminations and nonlinear loads. And this is common if you deal with uh, electronics such as transistors, uh, PN junctions or diodes and any type of semiconductor uh, of that nature. They, they do exhibit nonlinear characteristics. So how does this affect our transmission line and the propagation of the electromagnetic waves? Well, we're going to conduct uh, this. We're going to, we're going to do this or conduct this in the form of an example. So let's consider this scenario, uh, the one below here, where we have uh, a load applied uh, VL, and so we have this load applied here. Uh, it's uh, governing this voltage at the load, and this is a passive nonlinear load. So that means it doesn't create a line on the VI chart or VI graph. Uh, so let's look at what that looks like then. So on this graph here, there's a lot of other things which uh, I'll, I'll explain in a minute, but we're looking at this heavy dark line. So this is the nonlinear characteristics of our load. So in other words, as we increase the voltage across this load, uh, the current doesn't go in a linear fashion, it follows this line here. Uh, so that's what we mean by a nonlinear load. Again, it's, uh, it's the one exhibited by this green line here. That's a nonlinear load characteristic. 
So let's analyze this. We can now write an expression for the voltage and current uh, at the instant the switch is closed. In other words, at t equals zero, we close the switch. So when we do that, uh, we, this is like we've done before. We have the 50 volts. Um, and we have 200 IS, which is uh, the, the impedance here, this load impedance 200 times this, whatever this IS is that's going to be generated when the switch closes, plus the voltage across this, uh, across these terminals. And then this IS we can define as uh, VS, the voltage here, over the intrinsic impedance of our transmission line. So it's VS over 50. So we're going to now use these two equations with two unknowns and solve this graphically so we can get a, an understanding of what's going on here. So go back to our graph and uh, start to plot some of these things. So the first thing we're going to plot is that first equation, 50 equals 200 IS plus VS. So this is the voltage uh, from the source. And when we do that, it creates this green line here. It's just a linear uh, linear source. Likewise, we're going to plot the equation for the current, IS. Remember, that's just our voltage across the terminals at, at S, VS, uh, divided by the intrinsic impedance. And so now we want to solve this graphically. And of course, the way you solve two equations to unknowns graphically is the intersection point. And so we see here that they intersect at this point A. So what does that tell us? Well, that means at the point T equals zero, when we close the switch, uh, the initial voltage we see, the VS, is going to be 10 volts, uh, and the initial current to flow in the circuit will be 0.2 amps. So this is, uh, this is a representation of what's going on at T equals zero. Again, 10 volts, uh, 0.2 amps. So now we want to consider a time t equals one period, which in this case is one microsecond. And so we can write the equations for that. And so what we'll have then is that VL is going to be this uh, nonlinear load uh, definition. Uh, so that's going to be our, our current. And so that's uh, 50 times IL times absolute value of IL. And so that's going to be equal to a transmitted wave plus our reflected wave. And so likewise, we can write an equation for our uh, current at the load. It's going to be the transmitted current plus the reflected current. And all that is is going to be V plus minus VL minus V plus over 50, our intrinsic impedance. So that gives us 2V plus minus VL. So again, we've got two equations, two unknowns, and we, uh, we want to again solve this graphically. So here we're back to our, our uh, our graph showing the nonlinear load. And uh, remember, we're keeping in line, this is what's governing what happens on the VL side. So this has to be part of the solution uh, each time. And so the other part of the equation is this current IL, which is uh, 2 plus V plus minus VL over 50. And of course, we have to start from where we left off before at this point A. And then when we graph this line, this is going to give us the slope of the line starting at that point, and so it comes up in this direction. So now again, to solve the two equations to unknowns, we have to find the place where they intersect, and that place is point B. <clears throat> and just as we did before, uh, we can read where our voltage and current would be at those points, which here is going to be around 5, and then the current is going to be about 0.3. So this is after one time period, or as our, our uh, electromagnetic a wave reaches the load. This is what uh, this is what happens, or what we would read at that time instant at the load. So now, after two time periods, we're back to our source. So again, we can write these equations. And again, the the uh, the first equation is going to always be the same, but this time, Bs is going to be transmitted plus reflected plus the reflected transmitted again, or reflected again. Uh, going in the transmitted direction. And then our current, again, is going to be minus 2V uh, times the reflected voltage plus Vs over our intrinsic impedance. <clears throat> so this is all the same steps that we've done before. Uh, and so again, we can we have two equations, two unknowns, and we can again go back to our graph to solve this.
So this time, again, remember on the supply side, this line governs our uh, solution. On the load side, this curve line does. So we go back and forth between these two lines, whether we're at the source or at the load. And so our new equation now, and it has to go through B, our previous point, is going to be IS minus 2VI plus VS over 50. So that defines our new slope. And so since it's negative, uh, I mean, this negative sign here, so it's going to make it go slope in this direction. And so now we need to again find where this, these two lines intersect to get our solution. Of course, that's going to be at point C. And just like we did before, uh, we can read off uh, our voltage and current, which here is going to be like one and a half volts. And here we're at like two and a half amps, or 0.25 amps, excuse me. So we can continue this in this manner again, going back and forth between the nonlinear curve that defines things on this side and the linear uh, line that defines things uh, on the voltage side since it's a linear load. But again, um, it will be alternating back and forth between lines with a slope of 1 over Z naught or minus 1 over Z naught until we finally reach a steady state condition. So uh, we can go back to the graph and see what this looks like. So if we start to do that, we left off at C. So this red line shows, and I'll just step through the remaining steps. We would go from C to E. And remember, we're always going to go back and forth between points on this line and points on this curve, points on the line, points on the curve. And so from D, as you can imagine, if we were to go through that whole process again, we would go from D to E. And then finally, we would keep iterating uh, back and forth, back and forth, until we end up into the point of where actually these two lines intersect each other, the curved nonlinear load line and our supply source line. So this is our steady state point. So when we've done traditionally done things in your other classes, you just saw for this steady state point traditionally. But what we're trying to demonstrate through electromagnetics and Maxwell's equation, we're going through all these steps is, that's not what really happens in real life. It really uh, kind of goes through iterations until it settles into the steady state. And so again, if you're doing some really high speed switching or high, high speed, uh, high frequency uh, circuitry, you got to be careful because you're not always going to land right here. You may start transitioning when you're in these uh, intermediate steps and that can cause problems if you're not careful. But again, we can read the steady state solution, which here looks like it's going to be a little less than 3 volts uh, and like 2.25 or something uh, uh, amps. So, of course, we can graph this. Uh, if we want to look at the voltage uh, at the source, uh, we could go back and pick these off at uh, point A is where we see our first voltage of 10, and then at point C, we've got this voltage down here, and the voltage goes back up to what we've evaluated at E. Of course, at the load, we don't see anything until the first time period, and then after that, we measured around 5 volts, and then we went down to 3.5 or whatever volts we were at. Um, so we can graph those and kind of see what's going on. It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting to see that there's two totally different things going on at each end of our transmission line until we reach that steady state and it'll ring out to where these two will approach each other. So let's now consider uh, a logic gate circuit below a different type of one. The one, the first, the one we just did, we had a nonlinear load on one end. What happens, which is more real life, when we have one logic gate going to another? So here we have two inverters that we're connecting by this uh, transmission line here. Well, if we look at the graph of this, this is the, uh, the characteristic graph of one of these uh, diodes. And so, of course, a diode goes from an a output state of 1, which would be a high, to an output state of 0. And so these are the two curves at each end of this transmission line. This is at the beginning, or the, the, the start, and then this one here is going to be at the output. And so now we've got this input voltage uh, that we're going to put in on this thing, and it's coming up, and it rises up from some number down here up to zero volts. And so that should take us to an output of one, 
And so we see here we've got these steady state conditions defined, right? So this one here uh, looks like it occurs uh, at about 0.2 volts. And then this one here we're saying is at 4 volts. So those are our steady states. So when we have an output of zero, we're actually saying that's going to be about 0.2 volts. And when we have an output of one of these gates, uh, it's a uh, steady state of one, we're going to say that's about 4 volts. And this is can vary depending on a lot of things you can get into. You can study microelectronics or the LSI circuits or something like that. But let's see what happens when we transition. So first one we're going to do is transition from state 0 to state 1. So we start at the steady state 0, and now we draw these lines, which again have 1 over z naught. So this will have a slope of 1 over 30. This will have a slope of negative 1 over 30. So we keep going back and forth between the two curves, uh, and these will be our time periods, which will define these things, and you can see we go through all these various transitions. Well, if we look at that down here, uh, this would be at the, at the uh, output. So it takes uh, one time period for our signal to get from the uh, input to the output. So we stay at the steady state of 0.2 volts until then. So after that time, uh, we jump up and we can read this number off here. This is our voltage reading uh, B. And that looks like that's about one, a little over one and a half volts. So they said it's 1.55. And of course, we stay in this state until... Uh, our reflected wave goes back and re-reflects again and comes back and then when it does, uh, that's what's going on here to here reflects back. And so at this point D, you can see it looks like we're at about a little over two and a half. They say it's 2.6 volts. Uh, and so that stays for another two time periods until our reflected wave goes back and re-reflects. And then when that comes back, you see that we're at about 2.95, which that's this point here. If we were to keep going this, it would keep ringing out and keep ringing out until we got up to that steady state of 4 volts. Likewise, we can do the same thing uh, for transitions from state 1 to state 0. So if we do this, that kind of flips things a little bit. Now we're starting at this end. So we start out here. Again, we go at the uh, 1 over 30, which is this uh, intrinsic impedance defines that. So if we had intrinsic impedance of 1 over 50, 1 over 75, that changes, you know, what slope this line goes at, how quickly we could get to a, to a uh, steady state. So in this case, we start at 4. And so you see on the graph here at the output, we're already at 4. And so until the input signal reaches our train travels the length of our transmission line, um, we stay at 4, and then as soon as that, that signal hits, then we go down to 2. So you can see uh, this is the first, uh, first uh, period here. And then for two time periods later, the time it takes for this reflected signal to go back and then we transmit it back again, you can see we go here to here. And when we get there, if you were to read, it, be able to read that, that gives us our point 0.4. And then you can see it starts to... Uh, do like our, our previous example, you know, it starts to iterate pretty quickly. Uh, so the next iteration, if you could read it, um, it would be 0.1 volts until we finally get down to our steady state of 0.2 volts for our output. So again, you can see, um, we think that a diode just works to switch instantaneously from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, when in fact, uh, depending on how you design your circuit and and what's going on between your circuits, which defines your transmission line, uh, you actually can have quite a bit of activity between those two state changes. And then you have to be careful when you switch uh, and continue to do different things. So if your clock speed's faster than this, then you're going to have a mess. So you, know, you have, to, have to be aware of what all your time periods are and what your transmission line lengths are and what the effects of that is and all those types of things.